I'm Natalie DiNicola with Benson Hill, and I'm joined today by um, Dr. Robert Ludstig with the University of California, San Francisco, a leading authority on the impact of overly processed foods, particularly sugar, um, on health, and who's appeared on 60 Minutes and is as part of the past Crusonia Conversations. Aaron Wiggins, the Director of Digital Physical Transformation of Health and Wellness at Walmart, and Carter Williams, who just gave our opening uh, remarks. He's the CEO of iSelect, a venture capital firm focused on innovation around food as, food as health. So great to be with all of you today. Uh, Dr. Lustig, I'd like to start with you. Um, you've spent much of your career really focused on this connection between food and health. And this is particularly ti timely given the challenges we're facing with the COVID pandemic. So if, can you tell us a little bit about your work um, and kind of the state we're in, and in particular, the role that you feel sugar consumption plays on our immune system's performance and some of these um, diet related illnesses and comorbidity comor factors related to COVID? So let me start out by taking exception with the title of our entire uh, uh, event today, Food is Health. Uh, good food is health. Bad, bad food is death. And the question of course is, how do you distinguish the two and why do I say that? Um, as it turns out, modern medicine thinks that they can solve all of these problems, type two diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, and on and on with a pill, and they can't. And the reason they can't is because there are eight, count them, eight subcellular pathologies going on inside the cell that we don't call diseases, but they are the process of um, uh, cellular decompensation, aging. Ultimately, if those eight subcellular pathologies are working right, you'll be 110 playing tennis. And if they're working wrong, you'll be in a wheelchair at 40 with your legs amputated on dialysis and blind waiting for the Grim Reaper. And all of those, both directions are directed by food. But the question is how? And medicine can't touch those eight. And I'll name them for you. They are in order, glycation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, membrane instability, inflammation, methylation, and autophagy. Now, not one of those is an ICD-9 code. Not one of those gets reimbursed by doctors. Not one of those has a medicine that treats them. The only thing that treats them is food. The problem is that ultra processed food is exactly what's wrong for each one of those eight. And what we have done, as Carter described in the uh, opening uh, 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 monologue, is uh, we have abandoned real food for ultra processed food because it was cheap and it was scalable. Problem is we can't scale it anymore. And ultimately uh, the, it's come back to bite us in, uh, uh, in an economically uh, and um, medically and now social devolution way. So we do have to find that third alternative. And um, unfortunately our current food system is not set up for being able to deal with it. So my job is to bring the science to the policy. The problem is the politics keep getting in the way. And that's what today is about. Wow. Well, um, I'd like to move to Aaron now because, you know, retailers, obviously consumer demand shapes retail behavior, but retailers also play a really pivotal role in the food system connecting between um, the farmer and all the food manufacturers up to the consumer. So Aaron, can you speak a little bit about the role, you know, remark, remarks on some of these things that Dr. Lustig just highlighted, but what role do you see retailers playing as corporate citizens to help shape the kind of um, future food choices we have? Um, what kind of things is Walmart doing to help in this area of health and wellness? Absolutely, Natalie. So as Dr. Lustig and Carter both mentioned, we're finding ourselves now more than ever um, at this very pivotal moment where healthcare costs are outrageous and we're seeing more deaths and mortalities from um, the, the 
diseases that that Dr. Lustig mentioned, obesity, diabetes, chronic disease. Um, and all of that is a direct result of, of poor diet and nutrition. And so what we've done or in the process of doing here at Walmart is I'm on the Walmart Health Clinic team and we are providing access to affordable care, um, specifically the efforts that I'm leading are around nutrition and things across the enterprise that are directly related to, to food and diet. And we believe that creating a comprehensive model that only not only takes the services that we can offer in the clinic, but combining that with the access to our 4,600 stores, the clinics we're opening nationwide, and through programs such as our Pickup Today and food delivery programs, <clears throat> we will make that healthier food more accessible. And um, with the combination of the services and access to the food, we feel that we as retailers have not only a, a opportunity, but a responsibility to address these concerns. Well, that's encouraging to hear. Um, Carter, I want to ask you to chime in on this. So I have to say as a mother, when I hear some of the things Dr. Listig brings up, it's really alarming, frankly, um, but it's encouraging to hear the kinds of things that Aaron's talking about. Um, as someone though, who works in the food system for a long time, I know that it's a pretty complex system. And you pointed out in this idea of sort of this system, seafood system, um, between A, being really affordable and accessible, but lacking nutrition, system B, being healthier, but more expensive, less attainable. You hear about the kind of work, for instance, that Walmart's trying to do to bring us to scale. Can you talk a bit more about your thoughts on how this transition can really happen to get to broad scale of this, this combination of affordable, accessible, and more nutritious? In particular, maybe a bit about the role you see innovation playing, because we know you spend a lot of time thinking about that. Yeah, so we we see innovation. We're venture capitalists. We invest in entrepreneurs. And and uh, what that means is we, we sort of think entrepreneurs are typically good at going out and understanding the problem and coming up with a way to make an improvement sometimes good sometimes bad but 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 generally they're they're good explorers of new ideas and so uh entrepreneurs are also tend to bring price down if we look at something like the iphone you know it's in a sense getting better and cheaper over time the, the power you have in your phone is better and that's what we mean by deflationary and while it's really cool to see computers and TVs and all that stuff go down, our, our question as entrepreneur, as as venture capitalists, is can we apply that model to to entrepreneurs? And and so I think that the work that Dr. Lustig is doing is very important in terms of educating the policy people. I think we've gone through many decades of trying to figure out from a healthcare standpoint, can we solve this with with medicine? And I think there's a limit on medicine. Uh, and so and if it's now about food and food is about health, that the business model is changing and the conventional wisdom is changing, entrepreneurs are really good at doing that. So we, we're keen to, to think about what are the examples of products that we can bring out that are better food and cheaper. Because if... If it's better and more expensive, people will do it for a while because they're on a diet or they're persuaded somehow to do it. But if it's better and cheaper, then the bulk of people can sort of say, look, I'm, I'm doing it for many reasons. <laughs> it's cheaper and better. And while we can't on the entrepreneurial side solve that all, uh, there are rifle shot opportunities, I think, to, to sort of shift the food system. Um, some examples on that is, is when we think about tasty, nutritious, let's say we think about salads, for example, you know, 40% of lettuce is wasted in the supply chain simply through the progression of growth out to delivery. And, and you can solve parts of those problems by shortening that cycle. So things like App Harvest, which is a, a new tomato facility is coming out in Kentucky, is shortening the, the period so the tomatoes don't need to come from California to the East Coast. East Coast gets it quicker, Aaron gets them quicker, they're tastier, higher quality, people eat them, and maybe they're lower cost because there's 40% less waste. In other areas, certainly we, the a complexity is we are looking at what I'll call processed foods. Um, 
you know, things like an impossible burger uh, has a processed component to it. But if impossible burger uh, can be made cheaper and replace ramen noodles, uh, that trade off might be a net benefit, even if we can't necessarily get somebody to, to the perfect food system. Um, but, you know, we pay attention to entrepreneurs and, and energize them and, and bring them to the equation to, to be part of the answer. Yeah, and that's really exciting. Um, and I, I think that there's more activity in this space than there ever has been in the 20 years I've been working in this in the sort of food and ag space. Um, Dr. Lustig, going back to you for a moment. So Carter touched on, he mentioned policy. Um, and there's policy, there's also, you know, we've heard, seen things like price levers such as taxation, for instance, be utilized to try to help curb tobacco use. Um, talk a little bit about the policies you think are necessary or do you feel like something like taxation on nutrition um, for like sugar loaded foods could be useful in a company like, in a country like ours? Well, first of all, you have to get the science right because if you don't get the science right, nothing else matters. Let me give you an example of how we got the science wrong. We took milk and we took the fat out of it because we got the science wrong. We thought that fat was the bad guy. Turns out dairy saturated fat is likely protective against type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Dairy saturated fat and red meat saturated fat are very different. Red meat saturated fat are even chain fatty acids Dairy saturated fat or odd chain fatty acids with a specific phospholipid signature that actually confers protection against these diseases. But we thought, well, saturated fat is bad. We took the saturated fat out of the milk. And then of course the milk tasted like dishwater. And we said, how are we gonna get our kids to drink this? And so what did we do? We added the chocolate and strawberry. So we took one of the good things out to put a bad thing in and called it policy. Now, how dumb was that? And we're still doing it. So until you actually have the science and until policymakers understand the science, don't expect anything to change. So that's problem number one. Now, with respect to how to institute some sort of policy directive across the board, taxation is low hanging fruit. Taxation is easy. Taxation is deliverable. We have now seen that basically with the soda tax in six American cities and 28 countries around the world because it doesn't take much and you can earmark the tax for specific purposes. You could you know, uh, uh, supply, you, know, you could subsidize um, uh, uh, gardens with it or you could um, uh, subsidize school food with it, et cetera. So um, I'm not, actually in favor of taxation. And the reason I'm not is because taxes are really three taxes in one. The first tax is actually the subsidy itself. Why do we subsidize sugar in the first place? In part, um, uh, because uh, we have since 19, 1790 and the sugar industry is extraordinarily uh, 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 strong and has a lot of inroads uh, in both uh, parties. The fact of the matter is uh, it, it never made sense and it certainly doesn't make sense now, but you know, here we are. The point is when you subsidize something, that means you're taxing everything else in order to make both. Second, we have this chronic disease pandemic and everyone is paying extra in their uh, healthcare insurance premiums and employers are paying $2,751 per employee for obesity related health diseases, whether the employee is obese or not. You don't call it a, a tax, you call it a premium, but it's a tax nonetheless because everyone's paying it. And then finally, there's the tax A on soda itself. So it's really three taxes in one. What I would rather see is get rid of the subsidies, maybe the whole thing would go away. Alternatively, you could do something like differential subsidization, which is something that um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark did with alcohol back in the 1970s. What they did was they taxed hard alcohol spirits, but used the uh, money that was raised from the tax to subsidize low alcohol beer. 
So they provided the inducement and the punishment, the carrot and the stick, and they were yoked together to get people, nudged people away from spirits and toward low alcohol beer. And in the process, they saw improvements in productivity and reductions in cirrhosis and car accidents. And those uh, policies are still in place today. As an example, why couldn't we tax soda and use the money from the tax to subsidize water? The beverage companies make both. They're not out anything. You got to drink. So there are ways to be able to uh, influence policy based on the science when you understand the science. But the problem is policymakers today choose not to understand the science. Yeah, this is really complicated stuff. And it just seems very highlighted with everything that's going on today. Um, but we all know that everyone is sort of paying attention to what the consumer wants and what the consumer is doing. So going back to you again, Aaron, um, without consumer adoption, all of this is really for want. So in your opinion, what will get consumers more meaningfully engaged in this food is health, food is health story? What will drive adoption and influence of healthier, great tasting, you know, better for you kind of choices, given the kinds of challenges that Dr. Listig and Carter, challenges and I would say opportunities that they both have laid out. All right, so, so I'm gonna choose to look at it as an opportunity in that, as Carter mentioned, there is a really big movement around food as medicine right now. And we have, we have insurers that are willing to subsidize the cost of this healthy food. And they, they are now realizing that not only can they use this as a way to grow their customer base, but also improve health outcomes and to manage the increased cost of health care. So versus paying for drugs and expensive medical visits or procedures, um, they're subsidizing the cost of food. And so what we're seeing is that there, this, this has a potential to be a really big um, market play in that right now, $30 billion in 2021 will be spent to subsidize the cost of healthy foods and nutrition services. So there are a lot of insurers that are including that in their benefits, and this is expected to continue to grow over the next five years to, to a $90 billion market. So I think we at Walmart, we're going to take advantage of the fact that they're they're choosing to substitute the cost or subsidize the cost of that food. And um, I mean, approximately 60 billion of that 90 will go towards the, the purchase of healthy groceries. So I think we as retailers, as medical professionals, um, manufacturers, farmers, others in related fields, like we have we've got to keep the line of sights of these initiatives and movements and take advantage of the fact that um, there are others that are coming to the realization that this, this is a, a really big crisis that we've got to do something about. Wow. And you feel like a real momentum is starting to, you know, to form around it, Aaron? We're definitely seeing it at Walmart. That's pretty exciting. Um, Carter, can you weigh in on this? I know you've thought a lot about the healthcare system and its connection and the role it plays, um, yep. where it might not necessarily think about food as a lever, but you're starting to see more of that. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, so uh, connecting to all this, uh, we spend about $1.7 trillion in the United States on food each year, and we spend about $2 trillion on the healthcare costs associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and you sort of pull elements of cancer in. And those can, those are, and that's not even including a lot of the secondary costs in terms of uh, work outage and, and issues such as that. So we see this as a three point seven trillion dollar market. And uh, if you start looking at it from that standpoint, then and you just pause for a moment and say, well, could you do we need universal health care or do we need universal better food? And you start if you start moving into the universal better food camp. And say, let's solve the healthcare problem from a for a moment from a universal better food camp first. Uh, and you 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 explore that and think through that a little bit. All of a sudden, new ideas come up. Like, could Walmart offer? Walmart's got a lot of customers. They've got a lot of data around customers. Customers come there. Could uh, Walmart offer uh, patients with type two diabetes a, a food program that's convenient, easy? They have correlation, can pull the data together to understand compliance and the benefits Walmart um, 
in a way that people keep wanting to come to their store and that then instead of the costs associated with type two diabetes being something that's really borne by insurance, that it's more sort of buried in by understanding people's real compliance and, and reduction of, of costs. And you can, you know, it, all, it gets a little complicated at that point, but you can start thinking about different platforms at that point. And then you want to start saying, okay, can I come up with uh, continuous blood glucose monitors that help support that and help provide more data? And and all of a sudden, your 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 realm of solution starts wandering around a little bit. And for version one won't be perfect, but I, that pathway, the food pathway, if I think about what needs to be true to get to the point that we reduce the two trillion dollars, the food pathway feels like over the next four or five or 10 years, we can get to the answer. The healthcare pathway of let's come up with universal medicine and come up with this or that, that's been a pathway we've been on for 40 years and not been able to get consensus around. And so the final bit is if you can reduce the cost of that better solution, people will just buy it because it's cheaper. Uh, so I, I think it's a take the best lessons from, from from policy inclusive of maybe some active elements like that Bob mentions, leverage the concepts that Walmart and some of those companies have a certain presence that can, can drive the example and get everybody to understand the example to the point that they understand, oh, I should be paying more attention to my food and then insert entrepreneurs to sort of say, you know, who is the Elon Musk of, of, you know, they're a little crazy when they're an Elon Musk, but who's the Elon Musk of food that can sort of come in and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake this up and it'll, it'll be a little ambiguous for a few years, but 10 years down the road, um, everybody sort of catches on. I, I saw a picture the other day of Elon Musk in 2002 as employee one at SpaceX and then 2020, a picture of the, of the mission just the other day. Um, you know, as we think about entrepreneurs into this mix, it's, it's it's sort of a 20 year thing, but I, I think it's driven through more of the food. The blinding flash of the obvious right now is we should drive it more down the food path with an assist from healthcare. Yeah. Well, I would say I feel that there's so much more connection of food and agriculture to all of these other parts of our life, more than we've seen before. Um, our own health, health of our planet and onward. There was a comment that came up in the chat and it's a comment, but I think it can be posed as a question that's kind of interesting. And it gets to this idea that consumers tend to feel like healthy food is too um, too expensive. And sometimes it is, but they note that, you know, something like walnuts or almonds, people tend to think that's really expensive, but actually isn't as expensive as certain things is like potato chips or a bag of candy. But you might not think of those as being so expensive. Um, how, how do we help you know, raise awareness of this. And I think it puts Aaron in a little bit of an awkward spot as a retailer to be doing that, frankly, you know what I mean? How can we, like, what, what role do we all play in trying to help educate consumers on what their real choices are? Dr. Lessig? You were asking me. <laughs> I thought you were asking Aaron. Um, well, um, I, I Bob, the, the, the friend of all, co all consumer package companies. <laughs> uh, well, so it's very hard to educate a consumer, as I think we've all learned. Um, it, and often education and implementation are two different things. And what we've seen is we can teach people, but that doesn't actually uh, evidence as uh, changes at, uh, at the uh, point of sale. So we have some work to do, but uh, what, in order to answer the question, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is addiction. So people think that food can't be addictive because after all, it's necessary for survival because everything that is addictive is not necessary for survival. Cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol are not necessary for survival, but food is. And so there is a, you know, uh, a question as to whether or not that's the case. Is, is food addictive? Well, we've done the analysis. We've actually figured out what about food is addictive. And there are four things in processed food, two of which are addictive. There's salt, 
not addictive. Increases the salience of specific foods, but in and of itself, not addictive. There's fat, also increases the salience. I mean, which would you rather have, a Cinnabon or a Pixie stick? But not actually addictive, because if it were addictive, then people on the ketogenic diet would actually be gaining weight, not losing it. The two things that are addictive that have been plied into all of the ultra processed foods in the store are sugar and caffeine. The sugar and caffeine, caffeine is a model drug for addiction. It's not toxic unless of course you mix it with alcohol, then you have four loco and that's been banned. But the fact is caffeine is addictive and that's why when Starbucks raised its price, you know, sales didn't budge. That's called price elasticity. So we can look at price elasticity as the marker for hedonic substances within our food supply. And the answer is fast food is number one in terms of price inelasticity. That is people will pay any amount, then comes sugar, then comes juice. So soda, so it's, uh, fast food, soda, juice have the mo are the most price inelastic. And the reason is because they're plied with sugar. Let's take on the other side, eggs. Eggs are the most price elastic item. So when the price of eggs go up, people stop buying eggs. So the fact of the matter is by adding sugar to all of these ultra processed foods, what the food industry has done is they've said, well, when we add it, people buy more. Yes, because it's addictive. So we're not going to be able to change people's buying preferences or buying patterns until the food actually is reformulated to remove hedonic substances. So when we talk about education versus implementation, first, we have to implement food that actually has a choice. You know, my colleague, Jeffrey Sachs, famous Columbia economist, you know, talks about the, the difference between the rational and the irrational actor. You know, that's an old uh, paradigm at this point. But what he says now is that there is a third actor, the hedonic actor, who cannot assess value because they need their fix. So if everyone is sugar addicted, and they are, and if everyone is plied with sugar so they can't even avoid it, then how do you expect anything to change? So we have to change the food before we can expect people to be able to exercise choice. Uh, build in one point here. There is one particular behavioral economics, so geeking out on economics here, but if anybody's 55, 60 years old at home, your kids are home because of uh, COVID, how much weight have you lost? And I think my test on that is, is 95% of people have lost weight because their 20 something has sort of said, you need to eat better you got comorbidities. So there are the, those are not persistent influences, but they are a sign that if people develop better product, I think that there's some latent demand building there, which is an important signal for entrepreneurs to get going. It's, it's whether that's going to kick over and have enough force to deal with the addictive nature of uh, sugar. And, you know, sometimes we joke that sugar is the next tobacco. I don't know if that's a joke or whether that's a truth or what it is. That's not a joke. Uh, but it's, there's, there's a component, there's a component of trying to make good food more addictive than bad food. And certainly that can be done with price. And it can be done through social dynamics of your children saying eat better. Uh, and then I think it's going to be better innovation and in the quality of the core food um, with a little bit of a, you know, when you, there's a very subtle component here that we, that I think that uh, Dr. Lustig and I sometimes go back and forth a little bit on is if someone's eating ramen noodles, is it better to give them something as a, as an intermediate point, like impossible burger, which still has a lot of it's, it's source of micronutrients might be low, but is that, can you get people sort of into that on a price point basis, even though it is still fairly processed compared to like grass fed beef or, or lettuce or something. And so that's a, that'll be a little bit of a problematic area for us to sort of figure out in the, from an innovation standpoint. Well, let me, uh, let me just throw in another concept that, you know, sort of will maybe direct things. And the question is what's healthy. Okay. How do you determine what's healthy? The FDA, does not tell us what's healthy. They don't even have a definition for healthy. 
In fact, no one has a definition for healthy. And whatever definition they apply, it's going to be wrong anyway. I'm going to give you my definition of healthy. And I just wrote a book about this. It will be out in May. There are two things, only two things that determine whether something's healthy or not. One, protect the liver. Two, feed the gut. Any food that does both is healthy. Any food that does neither is poison. And any food that does one or the other, but not both, is somewhere in the middle. So what poisons the liver? What floods the liver? Sugar. What feeds the gut? Fiber. So a low sugar, high fiber diet is healthy. That's called real food. Unfortunately, ultra processed food is a high sugar, low fiber diet, and that's poison. And of course, there, there's everything in between, like for instance, juice. So juice, we take the fiber out. Well, it's still got some soluble fiber, so it still feeds the gut to some extent, but you are flooding your liver. And the data show that juice is just one rung below uh, soda in terms of causing fatty liver disease and type two diabetes. So it actually works when you look at the empiric data on what's out there. The point is we have taken the fiber out for shelf life for depreciation. We have added the sugar for palatability ostensibly, but really for addiction. So the two paradigms that we currently produce and consume food based on is inherently problematic for being able to deliver any meaningful form of health. And until we change the food, we're not going to be able to solve this problem because there is no medicine for this. There's no drug for this. So how do we get to protect the liver, feed the gut within a paradigm of uh, 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 taste and cheapness? That's basically the argument uh, and the, the, the challenge. Can we put labels in Walmart like that up on the food? For sure. Aaron. <laughs> came in that's a little re relevant to this. It's what is the possibility of a hyper-focused re-education of the public on what is healthy and why healthy eating is better? There's also an issue of accessibility to healthier foodstuffs in low-income communities. Maybe you can comment a little on that, Aaron. Yeah, so that, that's actually something that we're working in, and hopefully with, with um, the help of, of Dr. Dr. Lustig in the coming weeks. But we're we're going back and looking. So we hear from our customers. It's it's the there's information out there, but it's confusing. Like what is healthy, what's not healthy, um, and so we're going back in in revisiting a program that we kicked off years ago called Great for You that looks at sodium, salt, and fat levels. And currently that's just for our own private brand products, but we're going to take that criteria and look at it across the entire grocery catalog so that we can find ways to simplify the decision-making for our customers, be it through easy filtering, be it through tagging of the, the shelf labels, as you mentioned, Carter. Um, so that is something that, that Walmart is, is very well aware of. And also in addition to, to some of the, to that last part of that question where, you know, there, there are some products that are healthy that are more expensive, but we do need to re-educate the customers and help them determine like what are healthy swaps um, that can be made and that and that can be made for the an everyday low cost that we have there in Walmart. And so there, there's definitely some re-educating, but simplifying the process, it, it's confusing. The ingredients, the nutrition labels, how can we make how can we take the science that Dr. Dr. Lustig knows also well and apply that to the, the products that we offer in the storage and simplify the decision-making process for the customer? Wow. Well, we're getting a little tight on time. Um, I think my walk, my takeaway from all of this, and I just would be curious of a real quick word from each of you on it, is that we're kind of at a unique moment in time where there's a lot of things coming together. There's awareness across the food value chain. There's this real focus on innovation. There's experts like yourself, Dr. Lustig, that are, you know, are really raising this up. And then we have the unfortunate, you know, backdrop of this pandemic, which is kind of just bringing, highlighting all of it. Um, one word to describe how you see the opportunity in front of us over the next, you know, three years. 
Dr. Lustig, let's start with you. One word? One word. Daunting. Daunting, is that what you said? Daunting. It's better than haunting, daunting, okay. It's a, um, this, this is, this is, this is a, a hotbed of controversy and we have to get uh, our ducks in a row and we have to do it pretty quick. Yeah, and we're not right. doing it. There's an urgency. Aaron, you're one word. Essential, essential that we make the change. That's a great one. And Carter? Perfect. Wow. Let's end on that note of optimism. <laughs> okay, thanks to all of our panels. Really appreciated the chance to talk with you today. Thank you.